the communication sector, whether that's our phones, our devices, our ways of getting in touch with each other. So that's really the topic today is looking at coastal um, areas in particular, risks along coastal areas in particular, and how are we seeing those risks emanate and change and what should we be thinking about in the telecommunication sector in the coastal areas. We have a fantastic panel, but before we get to the panel, we have a fantastic keynote speaker today. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Ms. Gunjan Dave. Uh, she's completed her graduation and post-graduation from the prestigious Inter Indian Institute of Technology in Durki. She further pursued, pursued an MBA from the esteemed Jamnalal Bhargad Institute of Management Studies in Mumbai. In 1987, she joined the Indian Telecom Services and has dedicated more than three decades of her career to the MNT MTNL in Mumbai in various capacities. Um, she has assumed the role of member technology at DCC, um, which is the Digital Communications Commission at the Ministry of Telecommunication started earlier in June 2023. In this prestigious position, she's responsible for initiating policy decisions, driving technological advancements and strategic decision-making in the telecommunication sector in India. I would like to invite Ms. Gunjan Dave to provide us with a keynote at this. Thank you. Greetings to all the esteemed participants of this uh, webinar. Uh, we exist in a digital era where global digital economy and encompassing e-commerce, fintech, and digital services face substantial disruptions from both natural calamities and cyber attacks. Disasters wreak havoc on infrastructure, dis disrupt supply chains, and inflict financial repercussions on businesses worldwide. In navigating this dynamic digital landscape amid, amid disaster challenges, businesses must embrace adaptation, innovation, and robust risk management with disaster management emerging as the linchpin. Telecommunications assume a pivotal role in disaster management throughout the entire disaster management cycle embracing preparedness, response recovery, and mitigation. Effective communication during disaster recovery becomes indispensable, fostering connectivity between disaster recovery, agencies, rescue workers, and the affected public. Telecom facilitate real-time communication among emergency responders, government agencies, and affected communities. In disaster recovery, telecom are instrumental in search and rescue of efforts, logistics and resource management, personal deployment and aid distribution, utilizing mobile communication, internet-based platforms, radio communication and satellite communication systems become imperative when terrestrial communication falters. Additionally, telecommunications enable the swift dissemination of early warning messages to alert communities about impending disasters, thereby minimizing casualties. The Government of India has taken proactive initiatives in disseminating emergency alerts to various channels, such as SMS and cell broadcast messages. A unified alert protocol system has been developed and deployed in India, integrating all alert dissemination agencies and telecom operators. This initiative has played a pivotal role in transforming the early warning dissemination landscape in India with over 11 billion alerts SMS sent through the system to date. During the recent cyclone Biparjoy in Gujarat, June 2023, optimal utilization of this facility was observed, resulting in the sending of more than 50 million SMSs and zero casualties. Notably, the Government of India mandates that all new mobile phones sold in the country must possess the technical capability to receive cell broadcasting messages, ensuring widespread dissemination of alerts in regional language for inclusivity. In fact, in India, we have 22 regional languages which are notified in the uh, Constitution of India. 
In an effort to enhance communication accessibility, it is proposed that handsets include an auto readout facility, enabling even less educated individuals to receive and act upon critical alerts. This initiative underscores a commitment to creating a safer and more accessible communication system for all citizens. Guidelines have been issued for the installation of telecom infrastructure with adequate fire protection measures, redundancy of backhaul connectivity, and power in flood prone areas. Building bylaws incorporate provisions for constructing earthquake resistant buildings based on seismic zones. Adequate provisions for the deployment of cell on wheels during disasters have also been made. The Department of Telecommunications issued standard operating procedures for disaster management of telecom infra in 2017, subsequently amended it in 2020. State telecom disaster coordination committees have been established in each state involving all stakeholders. Regulate Regular meetings are conducted to review preparedness and enhance telecom infrastructure for efficient disaster management. CDRI aims to develop a comprehensive risk and resilience assessment framework for the telecommunication sector. In pursuit of this objective, CDRI is conducting a study on telecom infrastructure in India in coordination with DOT. Continuing this study, CDRI and DOT are jointly organizing an online international session under the D Disaster Resilient Infrastructure Dialogue Series. I extend my congratulations to CDRI for convening this dialogue on strengthening coastal telecommunications infrastructure resilience, exploring strategies and innovative solutions. In recent years, the demand for resilient coastal communication infrastructure has intensified due to global warming, which has led to climate changes, rising sea levels, tsunami threats due to earthquakes, and increasing cyclones. Today's webinar aims to address these challenges, defining future requirements and standards to fortify the resilience of coastal telecom infrastructure. Through collaborative efforts, we can design systems that stand resilient in the face of disasters. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. So, for emphasizing the necessity of resilient coastal telecommunication infrastructure, and for emphasizing the role of telecom during disasters, all in, from early warning on one end to coordinating emergency res, uh, responses post-disaster as well. Um, with this, I think we'd like to now move on to the panel discussion part. Uh, I would like to introduce our moderator for the session, Mr. Sanjay Agarwal. Mr. Agarwal is a gold medalist in computer science from IIT Delhi, currently serves as Deputy Director General in the Ministry of Communication in New Delhi. He has an extensive career spanning multiple ministries and locations, including in several states across India, in UP, Assam, Rajasthan, MP, and Delhi. He has garnered diverse experience in project planning, project financing, implementation, disaster management, public administration, and social engineering. Um, he has been recognized for his outstanding contributions in the field of telecom. Mr. Agarwal, over to you to start the session. Uh, thank you, Amit, and I welcome all the panelists. Uh, as we all know that in last uh, two and a half decade or so, uh, there has been a uh, so there has been a shift in the global approach towards dealing with the disasters and uh, with the collaborative efforts. Now we have been able to reduce the loss of lives, loss of livestock, properties, and infrastructure. And at the same time, the in last three decades, we can see that, that there has been a, a sea change as far as the digital communication technology is concerned. And uh, in last two and a half decade, as far as disaster management is concerned, there has been a focus more on the civil engineering aspects of the infrastructure resilience. However, we have not been able to garner or exploit the technological advantages which are available today. And there cannot be any better moment for, to, for us to have this discussion 
and i hope that this discussion will take the uh, lead towards uh, exploiting the digital communication features which are available for creating disaster resilient infrastructure not only for telecom but for also for other areas also so as the context for today's discussion has been set by dg cdri and member t and i'm thankful to both of them uh, now i'll move forward with the uh, introduction of the uh, panel uh, we have a wonderful panel here today uh, we have uh, a full spectrum one from planning and policy making in governments or world bank then we have uh, from academia a professor from university of uh, tokomo just a minute yeah tohoku and then we have a representative of association of industries we have someone who is working directly as cto and then we have someone who has direct experience as well as the passion in delivering the digital communication technologies to the communities so let me uh, i have a great opportunity to introduce all the panelists so we have mr rajinder singh uh, he is senior specialist global practices in the digital development global practices at world bank washington dc usa and uh, then we have professor fumi yuki adachi from university of tohoku japan then we have mr vikram tivetia he holds a senior position as deputy director general in coai it is a uh, cellular mobile uh, operators association in india then we have mr bryce hartley he is senior manager strategic partnership and market engagement with gsma at, at, in uk and then we have mr mudassar latif he is chief technology officer regional at dg cell pacific in fiji during the discussions today the themes on which we are going to focus are one is that the strategy and the solution for telecom resilience then the another area is that building resilience through policy interventions and third is the disaster preparedness so each panelist will be given about 8 minutes to share his remarks our first panelist is mr rajinder singh mr singh has 42 years of experience in digital development sector and has been working as senior specialist global digital development department of the world bank at washington dc for past 17 years mr singh has experience of working in telecom sector in more than 50 countries in all continents including fcv countries like afghanistan iraq west bank and myanmar rajesh sir as you have the experience 42 years experience of creating enabling environment in digital development sector so therefore i would request you to uh, give your views as how to create enabling environment to improve resilience of telecom infrastructure especially in coastal areas thank you very much cdri for giving me this opportunity and uh, thank you sanjay for uh, kind introduction uh, as you know our keynote speaker and amit uh, they were talking about uh, sharing what exactly they have done like uh, one thing which i particularly noted this unified uh, uh, tax messaging system broadcasting cell broadcasting system and amit mentioned about uh, tonga disaster last year what i want to talk about is uh, mainly you know when we talk about telecom technology things are changing at very fast right so the first thing which comes to my mind is that the policy makers and the regulators they have to focus on policy and regulatory environment in a manner that whatever technology developments are possible uh, i mean we don't become kind of a stumbling block in introduction of those uh, new technologies now one thing which comes to my mind uh, especially for coastal areas uh you know before we disseminate the information through cell phone and other telecom media uh the most important thing is how quickly or how early we can get the information that a disaster is likely to happen and few technologies which are emerging on the horizon are 
Number one is a smart submarine cable. So what it means is, you know, nowadays submarine cables we are mainly using just for telecommunication purpose. You know, the information is flowing across various continents. But what it also can do, it is possible to put a different type of sensors in the repeaters of the submarine cable, especially pressure, temperature, and seismic sensors. And these sensors, before even the storm or cyclone or anything hits the, I mean, the ground, uh, early warning can be uh, given by this technology so that, you know, the responders, they get sufficient time and evacuation or moving the population or whatever precautionary measures can be taken, that is possible. The second thing in optical fiber technology, you know, as we know that the attenuation of optical fiber changes if there is even a minor bend in optical fiber cable. So what happens with the help of uh, artificial intelligence data analytics, it is possible that these various uh, optical fiber cables, both terrestrial as well as submarine, if uh, there is any change, and because of that change, if there is a kind of bending in the optical fiber, that also can be early detected before, you know, other things, uh, through other things, we come to know about the disaster. So now our policy makers and the regulators, they have to focus on how do we introduce these technologies and discuss with various operators. And I'm sure uh, Vikram and other panelists are going to talk more about it. My second point is, which is very much relevant for, again, for coastal areas, is strengthening of uh, towers particularly. You know, India has uh, different uh, wind pressure zones. We design our tower depending upon that, but still the wind pressure zones are not updated very, you know, frequently. And sometimes the wind velocity can be very high. So how can we strengthen the tower infrastructure so that even in cyclone and very high wind velocity, our civil infrastructure can withstand that uh, pressure? The third thing which comes to my mind is uh, you know when when these disasters hit, and as Amit was mentioning that in Kathmandu for about one and a half hour, you know, it was a kind of complete uh, blackout as far as the telecommunication is concerned. And that's the time when telecom is uh, required really at the highest level of reliability and the capacity. So the question comes that the operators, various uh, technology providers, and the policy makers and the regulators, how can we quickly strengthen the capacity of the telecom network at that time because a lot of telecommunication is concentrated in that area. So our policy makers and the regulators, they have to give a lot of flexibility to telecom operators in terms of spectrum management because then these telecom operators, you know, uh, there is no time that they have to approach a spectrum manager that, you know, I need extra capacity in this area so please allocate the additional spectrum so that I can strengthen the uh, capacity. So that kind of flexibility is to be provided by policymakers and the regulators. And the final point uh, from my side is that this also has to be a kind of requirement, and I'm sure uh, India and other countries, they are taking care of it, uh, that the telecom service providers, they have these mobile towers. You know, just in case if everything is flat, these mobile towers along with all necessary equipments, they can be mobilized very quickly and the communication can be established. Of course, uh, you know, LEO satellites and there are other options. Uh, I'm not going to talk about a lot of details because one can devote a lot of time uh, uh, on each of these topics. So I just briefly mention that uh, this is the kind of... Uh, enabling environment which can be created uh, together by policymakers, regulators, and our telecom operators, so that in such disasters, telecom infrastructure is available to everyone. Thank you, and over to you, Sanjay. Thank you, Vikram. Uh, uh, 
thank you, Mr. Singh. Actually, you have very uh, particularly uh, gave a good idea that the smart submarine OF cables uh, they can detect any kind of earthquake in uh, the or any other seismic impact in the within the submarine areas when we can get the information at lightning speed uh, through sensors that yes some tsunami is going to come and that can be a, a good way to go ahead and uh, now we move on to the our next pan panelist uh, mr fumiyaki adachi professor adachi is an ieee life fellow and an ieice life fellow currently he is residing he is researching Resilient wireless communication technology intending to realize beyond 5G, 6G as a specially appointed research fellow and professor emeritus at the International Research Institute of Disaster Science, Tohoku University from Tohoku University. And then from July 1992 to July, uh, December 99, he was with NTT Docomo leading a research group on wideband, broadband wireless access for 3G and beyond. He contributed on developing of 3G air interface and standards known as FD, uh, WCDMA. Professor Adachi, as you have been associated with research on resilient mobile communication technology, therefore I would ask you, how can we ensure connectivity in various phases of disasters in coastal areas? Where then the next question to you is that the where should we begin? How can we identify the most significant risk and how should we prioritize those? Over to you. Okay, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this very much important uh, uh, work, uh, uh, the workshop. And uh, then I, I am very much uh, pleased to uh, glad to talk about the our, my uh, based on my research uh, experience about how to uh, uh, develop the uh, resilient communication, tech, uh, mobile communication technology, particularly for the coastal, coastal areas. Okay, so uh, first I'd like to share with you the current situation. Perhaps you know about the uh, earthquake which attacked the uh, North uh, Peninsula uh, the beginning of this year. Uh, and how connectivity is ensured in the coastal areas affected by this earthquake, it's a tsunami. I believe uh, that this will be a useful reference to you all. So pre uh, please, uh, slide one, please. Okay. Uh, this slide shows the uh, The Noto Peninsula earthquake uh, of the magnitude 7.6, which occurred at the uh, uh, very beginning uh, dates of this year, and uh, earthquake and uh, su uh, succeeding tsunami destroyed the houses and uh, roads along the coastline of the peninsula, which is shown in this uh, right figure. Uh, uh, then the mobile networks were particularly shut down, uh, were partly shut down. Uh, due to interruptions of uh, electric, uh, electric power and the backhaul link. So uh, the, we have to take up op, uh, operations to ensure the connectivity uh, in, uh, for the, those people living in those areas. So immediately after the earthquake, uh, in Japan, there are many operators and the four, operator, four operators cooperatively uh, initiated free Wi-Fi services called uh, uh, here the Five Zero Japan. To uh, uh, this is a free uh, with a uh, free free of charge. And uh, as of uh, uh, yesterday, seventh uh, January twenty twenty four, one cellular operator is going to prepare to provide free Wi-Fi services by using satellite. Uh, communications. Uh, this is called the Starlink at the evacuation centers. And then uh, on 6th January 2024, uh, two cellular operators, 
cooperatively initiated mobile phone services by uh, shipboat base stations to cover coastal areas hit by earthquake and tsunami. So this is uh, uh, what we are now taking uh, now to uh, give, uh, provide the uh, uh, connectivity to do, uh, those people who, who are living in, in uh, coastal areas attacked by tsunami and uh, earthquake. Okay, so uh, how can uh, we ensure connectivity in a, a disaster period? And uh, so I'd like to answer from a technical point of view based on my experience of uh, Great East Japan earthquake that occurred on March 11, 2011. So that's slide two, please. Okay, so this is slide two. As we know, the communication networks have become an indispensable basic infrastructure without which we cannot live in the present modern society. So I totally agree that maintaining connectivity is quite important during, even during the disaster period. The challenges are threefold uh, shown in this uh, picture. Uh, improving network survivability, uh, reducing recovery time, and efficient sharing and transmission of information during the recovery phase. To maintain at least minimal, con a minimal uh, connectivity during the disaster recovery phase, it is very necessary to develop a disaster resilient communications technology that makes efficient use of surviving networks, including uh, private Wi-Fi. And uh, so uh, the most significant risks are the collapse of uh, base stations, particularly uh, in, uh, for the mobile, uh, cellular mobile communications services, uh, which uh, uh, the base stations are co uh, they collapsed by earthquake and uh, succeeding tsunami. So even if some of them survive, they will be soon shut down due to the interruptions of electric, electric power supply. How to prolong the life of the surviving networks and, uh, and to utilize them effectively is quite important to ensure the connectivity during the recovery phase. I think our oper operations taken uh, this time for disaster caused by uh, we what we call Noto Peninsula earthquake will be a useful reference to you all. So back to slide one, please. Uh, can I see the uh, slide one? First slide, please. Okay. The, the first is to equip each base station with an electric power battery and generator facility lasting of uh, lasting one to two days. After uh, the Great East Japan earthquake in 2011, base stations are equipped with an, in Japan, equipped with an electric, electric power battery generator facility lasting about one day. But uh, this is not enough. So the use of solar pa power generating panels might be very helpful. We know that the mobile phones have a Wi-Fi transceiver function. So the second is to make it possible for any person in a disaster affected area to access all of Wi-Fi spots free of charge based on our experience of Great East uh, Japan earthquake, this idea is realized as 5.0 Japan Wi-Fi. The third is to deploy ad hoc mobile base stations via satellite links to the disaster affected area. One example is shipboard base sta stations deployed to the coast of Noto Peninsula after the earthquake that occurred on 
1st January this year. Uh, this was developed also based on the, our experience of Great East Japan earthquake. The use of uh, HAPS, which is high altitude platform stations, and also the drones is also uh, very helpful. Uh, mobile stations are now everywhere and become our important inf infrastructure. So the force is to make a world technical standards for resilient communication system architecture for future uh, beyond the 5G and uh, 6G uh, systems. Okay, so this is my uh, talk, uh, talk about the uh, uh, disaster resilience communications technology. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh... Thank you, Professor Adechi. Uh, you have shared very uh, nicely about the uh, kind of uh, effects which were <laughs> during the Noto earthquake. And the shipboard base station was particularly given free of cost by two of the operators. Now, uh, uh, thanks for sharing the experience over there. Now we have, we move on to our third panelist. He's Mr. Vikram Tivetia. Mr. Tivetia is Deputy Director General of COI, India's leading industry association for telecom, broadband, and digital services. He interacts extensively with uh, ICT industry leadership and senior officials in government of India on regulatory and policy matters. He is a member of board of GCF and is an active member of industry coalitions at national and international level. Uh, Mr. Vikram, since you have a vast experience to take industry stakeholders' point of view for policy interventions, my question to you would be that how can industry stakeholders and third parties collaborate to facilitate coastal telecom infrastructure resilience? Uh, you. Thank you very much, uh, Sanjayji. Trust I'm audible? Yeah, yeah, you people definitely are audible. All right. Thank you very much. So firstly, thanks to CDRAI and Department of Telecom. You know, it's very uh, nice and heartening to see about 170 plus participants you know, uh, joining this discussion. And uh, very nice to hear from uh, Mr. Rajendra Ji. Uh, I'm seeing him after a long time. And also uh, uh, Professor Adachi of the recent experience, uh, you know, early uh, uh, last, uh, last few days, in fact. And I hope that all the people who were affected by this, uh, Professor Adachi, are good and would benefit from all the work that you've done. Uh, with that, I will come to, you know, the uh, situation like as uh, we, uh, we all are well aware, India has a long coastline and, uh, you know, both on the Bay of Bengal side as well as on the Arabian Sea and uh, down south, the Indian Ocean. And uh, 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 given that, you know, there's a lot of uh, 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 population in the sense population centers which are uh, settled along the coastline. Uh, as well as all the economic activity, you know, of a movement of trade and goods and everything. So every year we uh, in India, uh, quite, uh, you know, reggae, um, almost every alternate month, there is a disaster situation in, in some coastal area. The, the, while it was not a coastal area, but two inland disasters was one of the tunnel boring uh, in, in last month where we had to bore in and, you know, get people recovered and how mobile coverage was there. So the important point in, in, in you know, that I'm coming to is one is the vulnerability and challenges. So that in the coastal areas, the challenges, of course, are, you know, cyclone, storm surges, rising sea levels as well and saltwater corrosion, right? And uh, uh, the other is uh, uh, the sheer dependence, you know, unlike many developed countries in India, there is only one, uh, let's say, uh, communication network, practically. It's the wireless communication network, whereas, you know, on the developed country sides, you will have, you know, some more satellite, you will have a cable and you'll have more, you know, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, optical fiber connectivity. So the uh, we have a huge dependence on mobile wireless and which is, uh, you know, predominantly, I would say maybe 90% plus a, a private uh, uh, telecom operators. 
And I was very happy to hear from uh, um, uh, Rajendra Ji that, you know, flexibility in allocation of spectrum. Indian operators have got one third the average uh, uh, spectrum that other telecom operators uh, have. So uh, this is an area which uh, Sanjay Ji in DOT you had mentioned, uh, right, uh, uh, for regulatory support. Uh, and it's uh, uh, because of the huge volume, because wireless networks uh, uh, volume is predominantly, uh, you know, video. And uh, today, because of, uh, uh, you know, the demand uh, for video, uh, even in, uh, you know, disaster situations very high. So the, the reorientation of the network to be able to carry that kind of traffic uh, in, in the uh, in, uh, uh, required time. With that, the collaborative strategies that we've got, uh, at least in India, uh, Gunjan Dave, Madam, uh, did mention some. So uh, the industry-government partnership is a very important one. And it is uh, a different parts of the government. So it's like a whole of government approach that is important, which works as a well-oiled machine, uh, both prior to the disaster, when the NDMA issues the disaster warning, and the preparations for disaster mitigation start, and then it goes into the phase of you know a, a recovery a, 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 just after the disaster, and a subsequent long haul repair of uh, the damage that is done. So in that there's there's a lot of you know collaboration as uh, as is evident, and one of the things which uh, uh, was mentioned earlier was the deployment uh, as an early warning was the ITUT specification for uh, the common area protocol uh, alert message. And now uh, what we do is that the Department of Telecom in India has a dedicated disaster management uh, cell and there are policy provisions uh, there. And they interact uh, very closely both with the industry because we have to, uh, uh, it is our assets on the ground and also the coordination required with the local government so the state government or the local municipality and uh, 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 you know other dependent utilities like power and a movement of logistics movement of men and material so that requires a lot of uh, coordination and uh, uh, this obviously uh, you know uh, during lockdown i had to uh, coordinate a lot of this on my own webex account actually so uh, the video conferencing facility today it really is a great facilitator for uh, uh, disaster management situations. Uh, the other important point which comes up is, you know, while the access part is, is there, the backhaul is an important part, right? And it is good to see that the backhaul now uh, in the coastal areas, it was important to have more, you know, optical fiber buried under the ground and uh, uh, you know, uh, made safe in uh, so that it is more resilient uh, to the disturbance that is caused to the surface uh, telecom uh, assets. So this is one area where uh, which is important uh, for us. Uh, we have uh, much lesser uh, fiber deployment uh, uh, on the ground. So uh, maybe on a priority basis, the areas which are more uh, disaster prone in coastal areas, as part of a policy or coordinated effort, uh, more optical fiber can go uh, underground, right? Another uh, thing is uh, the technology solutions that I see. So the good part is that uh, now uh, 5G uh, uh, rollouts have happened extensively in India. Uh, but the challenge is not on the uh, 5G rollout uh, in, in terms of the tower or the base station. The, uh, the challenge is on the device side. The 5G devices are still way too expensive, right? So uh, in, in which manner can uh, the government or the regulator try to bring uh, this uh, uh, the cost of the devices down, which would uh, impact both, uh, you see, uh, because what our experience, I'll come later, I'm told, uh, you know, uh, there's a later uh, intervention as well. But uh, the important part is, you know, this whole uh, resilience uh, focused uh, regulations. So in, in the in the base stations plus uh, uh, the, you know, on the backhaul side or the MSC centers on which they are dependent or the 
BTCs. So uh, these particularly should be in more strengthened buildings and in more, uh, you know, a better protected and more resilient uh, infrastructure. Uh, one of the things which is good, which we have not used so far, and what uh, uh, Professor Ad Ad Adachi mentioned, was that we should ramp up and focus on how to use drones uh, the moment, uh, you know, uh, both pre and uh, uh, during the uh, post the disaster once it stabilizes. Uh, delivery by drone and uh, even what i would seen one Nokia presentation, uh, it, this takes me back when 5G presentation, the, there was a working party 5G meeting in Munich and they indicated uh, the small cell base stations being delivered by drone to be placed at, you know, appropriate places where there are gaps. So that is something which comes to my mind is an area that should be, uh, you know, explored a little more. And uh, the other part about the uh, collaboration, one is, uh, you know, documentation of whatever is done. If you have documentation available, then the, uh, the post analysis, you know, after action report uh, by various stakeholders to facilitate better coordination. Because uh, uh, what uh, we find one of the things in uh, India experience has been power supply. Is, is a major thing, right? So uh, while lo a lot of uh, towers uh, do have uh, 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 diesel gen sets, generating sets, and there is battery backup, the challenge comes up is in movement of fuel. So uh, getting a facilitative, uh, uh, you know, uh, having the local petrol stations uh, to earmark supplies, which can be provided to the telecom operators to, uh, you know, uh, uh, continue the uh, uh, DG set uh, supplies. And uh, uh, in the end, I'll say uh, for a long time, the PPDR network, uh, the NDMA has been, you know, there are TRI recommendations on setting, a, they've set, uh, recommended the spectrum assignments and uh, the making of a, a PPDR uh, network. Uh, somehow that needs uh, to be, you know, re-attended to. Uh, that would be uh, uh, something good to do. And the last thing that I'll say uh, 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 for the time being is uh, the training of the personnel. You see, uh, as private people, typically, uh, you know, uh, 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 in companies, uh, the people move, right? They change companies and, you know, uh, not necessarily stay in the same place. But earlier, there used to be, I recollect, a territorial army uh, regiment of the BSNL which was trained uh, at, for disaster telecom uh, uh, you know, work. So maybe a specialist entity within the NDMA, uh, which is trained uh, for deployment of you know, uh, data or wireless data networks, uh, which can be facilitated uh, uh, you know, um, for, as part of the skills, special skills required during disasters. Uh, which uh, these people can be trained for, given specialist training, uh, so that uh, uh, you know their efforts are put to uh, good use. Um, that, that's it for now. And there are a couple of more points maybe in the next panel. I'll uh, have occasion to articulate them. Back to you, Sanjay Ji. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vikram. Uh, I'm really glad that you have shared. You have touched upon one of the very, very important points. And... Uh, I mean, uh, a number of points which I have noted from your conversation, but I'll share uh, two of that. That yes, demand for video post-disaster is uh, increasing like anything and then the bandwidth requirement also increases. The expectation has gone beyond. That is uh, definitely a very important point. And the another, another point which, which you have mentioned that the documentation is very important. And uh, in uh, in India, we have the documentation only for last five years. And had we had the documentation for 20 odd years, we would have been much uh, more effective in uh, drafting a policy. And I'll sh uh, share much, uh, a little more after the first round of the panel discussions. So now we move on to our fourth panelist, Mr. Bryce Hartley. Mr. Bryce, has, uh, Mr. Bryce Hartley is a social impact professional 
with over a decade of experience in disaster reduction, displaced persons, education, digital inclusion, and livelihood. He is passionate about leveraging digital technology to empower individuals and communities. He is currently working at GSMA to leverage the power of mobile industry to support many act initiatives, especially, specifically around sudden onset disasters. Mr. Hartley, uh, welcome to the discussion. And it is great to have a person who has a passion for leveraging technology to empower communities. Will you throw some light on as how can disaster preparedness enhance coastal connectivity resilience and what is the role of early warning systems? And I would also like you to speak a little about what are some innovative solutions that service providers can provide to strengthen connectivity in coastal and remote areas. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, first, for, for having um, me in this webinar, uh, as well as uh, these excellent questions and to the many points that have been raised already by the other panelists. I think it's been a really, um, a, a very enlightening and interesting uh, discussion so far. So to the first to the first part of the first question, um, we certainly find that preparedness is key to resilience, um, certainly in more vulnerable areas such as coastal, um, coastal communities. As, as we all know, every second counts uh, during the response phase. So it, doing as much as possible in advance, we find to be uh, key because that's really where we have more opportunity in terms of um, yeah, improving the resilience. So one of the areas certainly that the GSMA is um, a big advocate of is the, the creation and more importantly, the continuous refinement of clear uh, standard operating procedures or SOPs. So on the internal side, certainly for keeping um, telecom uh, operators own staff uh, safe, as well as protecting their infrastructure, but also in terms of how, say, the telcos uh, interface externally with customers and the wider community. And the third aspect where we work on perhaps the most is around coordination, as um, we find that, it, as I'm sure many of the attendees have found, it's incredibly complex. There's uh, such a wide range of stakeholders from, say, suppliers, uh, along the, um, as well as the government, multilateral, civil society, and other ecosystem players. So having those uh, SOPs really defined and also continually, continuously refined as as the world changes, you know, in terms of say the procurement of equipment. I think one of the points mentioned before that's um, very quite salient and resonates with us is, is um, around uh, energy and making sure that that there are that there's a clear supply chain and sort of procedures to ensure continuity as that can be quite complex as well as how it can be procured not only from suppliers but also it, say that as a donation from from multilaterals and and ensure that that is that, that it's able to be done in sort of a, a very easy manner as well as say um the expedite expediting um the customs for importation of equipment in particular for countries where the tempera convention has been ratified such as in india the other area that that we find when it comes to preparedness is um uh, to have regular disaster simulations, which most, say, uh, MNOs already do, as well as uh, other government entities. But something that we hope to see more of in, in the coming years are uh, sim disaster simulations that include all stakeholders, um, rather than just maybe uh, internal stakeholders, as, I, as we find this is key uh, for the coordination aspect. And then to the other part of your question around early warning systems, we, we advocate for a multi-channel, multi-technology early warning system as, it, as they're critical uh, for mitigating the impact of a natural hazard on the affected population, as well as um, providing adequate warning for telecoms providers and their staff. And another is a, an aspect of this that's been mentioned before, but, but is worth um, emphasizing is the adaptation um, or adoption of the common alerting protocol for these warnings so that there's a consistent messaging being broadcast when multi-channels are being used. And certainly we we would say that mobile is one of the key channels for early warning systems um, as it's able to reach such a huge amount of the population, not only those with smartphones, but also those with say um, button phones. And again, uh, which I was, I was glad to hear uh, mentioned before, but cell broadcast, we would we, we advocate as one of the most effective ways to disseminate uh, mobile early warnings. Um, as they avoid network congestion and they're able to reach all users regardless of the provider they subscribe to. And we have an, uh, a recently published report 
um, on sort of uh, on cell broadcast and how it can be adopted into early warnings. And then lastly, on that sort of uh, subject of early warnings, uh, certainly um, we're we're very happy to be part of the UN's Early Warning for All initiative, which aims to provide up um, it aims to ensure that everyone in the world is covered by early warnings by 2027. And the initiative recognizes the key role that the telecommunications industry plays. Um, and I think that's a it's a great opportunity. And then to the this the second question you asked around sort of innovative solutions. I think there's there's a huge number of them, and I'll just uh, highlight a few. But certainly um coastal communities and remote areas face unique challenges for restoring connectivity. And these solutions um have made a tremendous difference um certainly in recent years. Uh, and so one of them is certainly that, that damaged infrastructure can make transportation of equipment overland difficult or even impossible. And as uh, as we heard um, previously from the professor, um, in Japan, we, um, our our members, um, our mobile operator members, have used um, have used ships uh, to provide base stations and 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 connectivity when um, connectivity on land is compromised or is not possible to perhaps reach those areas, which I think is uh, really useful. We've also seen our um, operator members in Japan use AI to create dashboards that can process big data more quickly that aids then in government decision-making um, during disasters, such as uh, the most effective um, evacuation routes. And then in, in another area, um, with quite a large number of coastal communities in the Philippines, our partners um, at the World Food Program and the, and the government of the Philippines Department of Information and Communications Technology um, has a project called Gex Move, which employs heavy duty trucks, motorcycles, and drones to extend connectivity in these remote and coastal regions. So they have these different bits of equipment pre-positioned across the country and then and then activated essentially, including these mobile um, sort of uh, uh, command centers, which have been uh, proved quite useful. And then lastly, um, Again, as I believe someone else has mentioned, we we are starting to see um, the tremendous potential, certainly of um, of satellite of direct satellite to smartphone communications. There is a test um, a, in the Pacific Islands that really showed great promise, uh, in particular for these um, coastal and uh, remote regions. And that's uh, all all from me for now. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Hartley. Uh, you had talked about that, yes, there should be some clear standard operating procedures. And uh, moreover, you have also talked about the common alert protocol based early warning dissemination system and the cell broadcasting on that. In India, we have recently uh, developed and tested the cell broadcasting pan India. And with that, we experienced that, yes, uh, targeted dissemination of alerts can be done within 10 to 30 seconds. And this is one of the key technology which should be adopted worldwide. So now we move on to the our fifth and the last panelist for the discussion is Mr. Mudassar Latif. Mr. Mudassar Latif has more than 15 years of experience of working in the telecom sector in Pacific market. Currently, he is holding the position as regional CTO with uh, DG Cell uh, Fiji Hub Markets. Over the past seven years of working as CTO, Mr. Budassar has worked on multiple natural disaster recovery projects, including Category 5 cyclones in Fiji, uh, Vanuatu, Swama, Tonga, and uh, tsunami recovery for Digital Tonga. Mr. Latif, as CTO, you are having experience of directly facing challenges posed by disaster that include Category 5 cyclones. So it would be great to learn from you that what challenges future low latency and high traffic use cases like 5G can bring to resilient telecom network planning and possible strategies and solutions around this. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sandhya. And thanks for CDRI to uh, arrange this wonderful forum. So it's very good. We should have this more frequent, I think, collaborations because that everyone can learn from it and we can improve our strategies uh, from a telecom communication operator's perspective. Uh, I will quickly actually uh, discuss about my experience in the Pacific and then we'll go into the further detail of your question as well, mindful of the time as well. Uh, I've been working, as you said already, Mr. Sanjay, 15 years in the Pacific and then have obviously worked on multiple disaster recovery scenarios 
In last five years, we have observed more than five Category 5 cyclones across the Pacific countries. Uh, and when I talk about Category 5 cyclones, the wind speeds are like normally around 250 km per hour. And the cyclone obviously, as you know, brings not only the damaging winds, but also flooding as well. So that's where it gets tricky, uh, I believe, when a, one disaster or multiple disasters are clubbed together. Uh, so while we continually work on our systems, our analysis, our cyclone preparedness, but when you have a multiple disasters happening at the same time, sometimes your manual or textbook doesn't work. That's what we saw in the Tonga even. So there was a volcanic activity. There was around two centimeter of a volcanic ashes uh, around the main island. Your satellite links won't work even. And then on top of it, the earthquake and a tsunami, the only submarine cable in the country got damaged as well. Similarly, last year we saw in Vanuatu, uh, there were two category four cyclones just within 48 hours apart. Uh, so as these cyclones are happening and then these different disasters are happening, we are also continually learning and then improving our preparedness. I think uh, everyone can work towards that recovery and disaster, obviously uh, coming out of that disaster. But the key is as the different panelists also spoke about how we can mitigate outages, how we can improve it, how we can learn together with either the policy, with either design in a redundancies in your network or actually having a team trained or a tools uh, that can you can actually be more active or a more uh, quick to a reaction of any of these disasters is a key. Uh, what we have seen in our network designs as well, like redundancy of a power is a one thing that was discussed as well. Not only the grid can failure, but your generator can have a problem. But from an operator perspective, when we are deploying a network, we normally categorize the network, what's the coverage layer and what's the uh, capacity layer. Your coverage layer is given a more priority from a redundancy perspective because you need to make sure when there is a disaster, everyone can have a basic connectivity. And that's what is provided obviously from your coverage layer. So the tower infrastructure needs to be more robust. Your power design needs to be more robust either the fuel backup or whatever, you need to have it obviously on those sides from the energy perspective, you need to design from that perspective. And then it comes to the backhaul side of the things, which is also important from a 5G use case. As the technology is uh, evolving, obviously we are seeing a lot of new use cases that will come up as well. So we need to keep up with our design. Uh, if we are talking about uh, we said geostationary services, which was usually normally used in Pacific countries, they are good for a basic connectivity. But when we uh, speak about the use cases, which can bring in by a remote surgery in hospitals and uh, like driverless cars and stuff, probably the geostationary satellites won't be able to support use cases. So that's where I think the Leo satellites, more redundant submarine cable, smart submarine cable, which was discussed earlier, and all those all of those technologies probably will be useful. And that's what we are working with in a Pacific country as well, how we can design, how we can improve the connectivity with adding more fiber, with adding more submarine cables, with adding a Leo satellite, or what was discussed earlier as well, direct to handset. So the node B are installed on a Leo satellite. There are multiple Leo operators coming on board with that technology. I believe that will be also important to ensure all the people have some basic connectivity during disaster times as well. But as the technology is evaluating, I, I see a lot of SD-WAN solutions that probably will be required either through a terrestrial links, through fiber, through submarine, through satellite at the remote end of the customers or the Wi-Fi solutions that needs to ensure, obviously, you, have, you can support the high video, high definition videos, high bandwidth utilization, use cases with a very, very low latency. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Latif. Uh, you have shared the challenges about the future low latency and high traffic use cases. Yeah. And you have particularly emphasized upon the robust backhaul, especially for 5G and direct to mobile solutions. Uh, yes, of course, uh, as we have had discussions about the uh, data uh, availability and uh, recording of the details, as it was pointed out by Mr. Vikram, I'll also share one example that. Uh, 
in India, when uh, we analyzed the details available with us for last five years, then we found that even during cyclone, the major region of uh, telecom services disruption is fundamentally the power outage. And the power outage in uh, most of the cases goes from 48 hours to uh, at times a few days. So during that time, whatever battery backup you have that gets exhausted and the mobile network operators find it's very difficult to uh, refill their diesel uh, in the engine alternators and to run the engine alternators because most of the areas are inundated and then there is uh, some mud or it is very difficult to reach over there. So uh, now with the collaborative effort with the power authorities and other DR agencies, we have achieved, uh, we have made sure that the power restoration is fast to the critical critical infrastructure. And with that, in the last two years, we have been able to uh, restore telecom services much faster and looking at the critical areas of DR agencies, we step, uh, install cell on wheels. So now uh, we, I would like to be, as a time permit, that I would uh, like to have some quick uh, round of uh, uh, another set of discussion with the uh, panel panelists here. So uh, as Mr. Singh, as you have talked about the smart uh, submarine optical fiber cable uh, uh, and the policy to become enabler basically for the uh, telecom service providers. So my question to you is that to improve telecom infrastructure resilience, do you have any suggestion for developing the synergy between technology and policy and regulatory issues? Thank you very much, uh, Sanjay. <clears throat> The, the point is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, policy makers and the regulators, they have to scan the horizon and they have to see like what are different technologies which are being developed, uh, which might not be still in the stage of commercial de deployment. But uh, in my opinion, policy makers and the regulators, they have to be a bit ahead of others because as and when industry is ready for commercial deployment, this thing, it is not delayed because of the policy and regulatory issues. So that's my one point because generally what I have seen uh, after working in so many countries, uh, in fact, there is a wrong conception. Sometimes the regulators they consider that, you know, technology is not my domain. This is for the industry and this thing. I, I fully agree with this approach that uh, technology deployment should be left to the industry. But at the same time, when industry want to deploy a particular technology, and if you start raising some regulatory issues, then it becomes a stumbling block. The second point I want to mention, I think Vikram earlier mentioned about the training. You know, uh, when it comes to training, it, it's a very, very generic term. But in our case, uh, that synergy between the regulator and the industry somehow is not developed so effectively. You know, like, uh, for example, I have, uh, while working with TRAI, I have experience and I always used to tell our technical people that you have to interact more and more with the technical people in the industry. Because otherwise it will be like, you know, learning the swimming without a swimming pool. I mean, if we are just uh, reading about technology and this thing, but if we do not have very strong uh, collaboration between our academic institutions, between our research institutions, industry, the whole, I, I don't mean industry, just the telecom operators, but the vendors, and our policy makers and the regulators. So that is uh, one thing I, I would like to point out here is uh, that many times, you know, there are a lot of activities where our students, especially like uh, Sanjay, you are also from IIT Delhi. I also studied in two IITs, Roorkee and uh, Delhi. Uh, what I always, whenever I visit these institutions, I always say that uh, the, our real potential is not being, uh, I should say, is fully utilized. 
these faculty and the students combination, they can do wonderful work, which can be at a much lower cost and which can be very effectively used by the industry and by the regulators. So in my opinion, these are the like few suggestions where if we develop this kind of synergy, I think our results can be more cost effective and they can really make a change. Thank you very much, Sunday. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I uh, really fully agree with the with your views that the policymaker and regulators should not uh, sit in their offices without in having interaction, not only with the telecom service providers, but the OEMs and the other uh, solution providers uh, at academia. And together, we should be proactive in our approach uh, to deal with it. So, uh, sir, one more thing I would just like to share with you that um, uh, I'm having first interaction with you over uh, this digital platform, but I have heard a lot of you and uh, people have a lot of regard and I'm sitting in the same building where TRI office is there and I would like to have further discussions on the topics which you have just touched upon. Uh, and with that, sir, I'll move on to the next panelist, Mr. Adachi. Uh, Mr. Adachi, as you have, you are doing research in the resilient wireless communication technology. So, what are the challenges in developing telecom standards for resilient coastal telecom infrastructure? If you you put some words about that, so that's good. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your question. Um, as a researcher at uh, both the industry and uh, have experience of uh, both industry and academia. I'd like to answer based on my experience of the uh, Great East Japan earthquake again that occurred on March 11, 2011. Okay, uh, after immediately after this earthquake, our government established the resilient ICT research center in April 2011, one year later, within existing uh, National Institute of Information and uh, Communication Technology called the NICT Japan. Since this research center has been, since then, uh, this research center has been actively conducting the research and developments of resilient ICT technology. Because, uh, you know, Japan uh, have uh, attacked uh, many times, almost uh, almost every day, by a small and big earthquake and sometimes a big uh, tsunami. So we have to be, uh, uh, say, uh, prepare. We have to prepare for the uh, uh, those the uh, uh, disasters uh, to uh, to keep the. Uh, uh, minimal connectivity. Uh, so uh, I think uh, uh, establishing such a research center might be very helpful even uh, in India. And uh, by the way, the key features of uh, beyond the 5G, now we, we are using uh, 5G uh, systems. Now the people and the researchers and uh, uh, engineers are working towards beyond the 5G and 6G uh, systems. 6G will be appeared uh, will appear in 20 around 2030, five years uh, uh, later, uh, six years or seven years later. So those future uh, com uh, mobile communication systems include uh, resiliency and uh, also the use of hubs and satellites. Or in those uh, future uh, systems, so that uh, people can use their mobile phones. Uh, I think it is. Uh, uh, I think uh, resilient ICT technology is very much strongly uh, recommended to be included in the technical standards for future uh, 6G systems, so that the people can use their mobile phones if, if um, disaster strikes, no matter what, which country they are giving, uh, visiting. So uh, I think it might be a, a good idea to hold workshops periodically uh, together with uh, national institutes 
operators and uh, research engineers from different countries, including Japan and uh, uh, also uh, Singapore and Taiwan and other countries surrounded by uh, oceans to share recent results and to exchange ideas uh, for vegetarian IC techn technologies. As a consequence, this will greatly contribute to establishing technical standards for uh, resilient uh, beyond 5G 6G systems. This is my view. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Edeji. Uh, in fact, uh, you have rightly pointed out that there should be multiple interactions in the form of workshops between academia and between the other stakeholders and across countries so that we can have a fair exchange of information. And they, over the last two year, two decades, what we have seen that in any other area compared to any other area, there has been more of the international collaboration in terms of disaster management or disaster risk reduction. So similarly, we should move ahead in this direction. Now I'll move on to Mr. Vikram. Uh, Mr. Vikram, as you have pointed out in your last discussion that uh, there have been uh, disasters every two months in India. So uh, my question to you is that what have been the challenges for telcos or infrastructure providers have experienced during various disaster situation in coastal areas in India? Uh, thank you very much. Happy to be back. So the question, uh, you know, the major challenges for us, one again is uh, what uh, uh, Rajendraji mentioned is, you know, uh, uh, the lack of allocation of even a, a temporary spectrum to enhance your uh, uh, both access and backhaul. Uh, uh, so uh, that part as a part of policy, because we continue to work with the same uh, assignments, uh, irrespective of whether there's a disaster or not. So now that with the Telecom Act, uh, you have uh, certain provisions, but I hope that it, as part of the rules which are written for spectrum, uh, uh, you know, we can uh, build in or bake in uh, this requirement so that it becomes an automatic uh, uh, thing without any bureaucratic uh, separate approvals. The second challenge is uh, the uh, uh, priority, uh, getting priority movement, whether it is on aircrafts or on trains or on, you know, vehicle movements. Because, uh, you know, in the disaster area, you have to send in the uh, men and material from outside the disaster zone, somewhere, you know, back away. And in the disaster area, uh, the priority which the local administration gives for uh, movement of telecom men and material, there is, uh, uh, as uh, you are well aware, the local term cell or local LSA officers do interact with the local administration. Uh, but... The, the, there have to be, you know, uh, uh, regular meetings uh, so that, uh, you know, if you, because the government officers get posted out, then there'll be a new government officer every, you know, two, three years in different departments or the district commissioner or otherwise. So like a standing committee for, you know, uh, disaster management, which includes power supply people, which uh, includes the roadways people and uh, the fuel people. So that, uh, you know, uh, we don't only go ahead and meet each other and uh, talk to each other when a disaster happens, but we do it, you know, ahead and post. Uh, that is the other challenge and uh, suggestion as well. Uh, the other point is that today you see with uh, 4G, 5G, or uh, we will get a lot of, uh, th there's potential uh, for a lot of Wi-Fi calling because voice Vikram. over IP. So Vikram. Yes, time. Uh, actually, we are, we are running a little short of time. Oh, okay, okay. I, I, so, I'll just close on that. Uh, the other thing is, uh, uh, I'd mentioned earlier, but I think there is a good case for involving the drone companies as part of our discussions, uh, uh, whether at DOT or the local level, because that is an asset class which is developing and has good potential, uh, uh, as uh, Professor Adichie also did mention uh, that time. And last, of course, is the HAPS. So HAPS is a good potential. I don't know if we recollect uh, the, uh, 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 you know, uh, that is gaining a lot of attention in ITU, that part. 
and lastly uh, the uh, the documentation now with artificial intelligence if globally we have a platform where everybody inputs the data into one central place then you can run uh, some uh, algorithms or uh, uh, you will have a base learning data about disasters on which you can build some solutions so with that back to you yeah thank you vikram actually uh, uh... You you all raised all the pertinent points and there is no question about it. And the, as far as the priority movement of the vehicles and other things is concerned, so uh, over the last two years we have been uh, we have seen that the collaborative efforts makes a lot of impact. And that thing we as uh, in India we have been making that effort and that experience we can share internationally also. That how can we have a collaborative effort with power authorities or road authorities or petrol uh, or gas authorities. Thank you so very much. And now we move on to the uh, Mr. Bryce Hatley. Mr. Bryce, as you uh, particularly talked about the collaborative efforts of the stakeholders, so how can community engagement be enhanced for collaborative effort in strengthening the telecom infrastructure resilience? Thank you. Uh, That's a great question. Quick uh, two to three minutes, please. Sure. No, no, no. I'll, I'll, make, it, I'll make it very quick. Don't worry. Um, no, yeah, I, I think it's really critical to engage the community um, members as as equal stakeholders, ideally from the onset, you know, where, when planning related initiatives or plans ar uh, around sort of mobile and um, and in, in emergencies. So certainly this includes, say, consultations around the needs and challenges um, they might face during an emergency and really hearing those. And I, when we would say one of the biggest, as I know I've, I've mentioned before, but it, it is it is true in our experience is really the coordination between the different stakeholders to leverage those networks and initiatives um, in uh, well, as we try to consult, say, the community. So rather than oh, you know, five of us, uh, uh, five different organizations um, asking the similar questions to the groups. It's looking at how we can build on each other's initiatives. Because one of the things we, we oftentimes find is that these community organizations are perhaps being asked the same question by multiple uh, you know, companies or orgs, and then they become exhausted and they don't want to engage as much on these. So the, the more we can try to coordinate amongst ourselves, that is you know, everyone from the government to multilaterals to the, to the private sector, it's not only best in terms of how we engage with the with the community, but also to maximize our resources that we're not replicating efforts. And I'll leave it at that because I know we are we're short on time. Thank you. Now my last question is to Mr. Latif. Mr. Latif, as uh, Chief Technology Officer. Uh, of a company where you are facing so many of the coastal uh, uh, cyclones, uh, you are the right person to ask uh, this question that what framework can be adopted by industry stakeholders to enhance collaboration in planning a disaster response to improve recovery efforts? Thank you very much, Mr. Sanjay. So, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, the lot has been already said by a different panelist as well, but I believe it's a very important topic as well because, again, as a telecommunication operator, we are not the alone who can recover the whole thing. So we do need a support from the regulator, uh, from the government and the related agencies and partners as well. <clears throat> I will share a very quick example of what I have seen in the Pacific countries in different scenarios. Uh, there was one cyclone in one of the Pacific country uh, where there was a quite extensive damages. That country only had a one helicopter and the helicopter was booked by the government officials for a two days to do their service. <laughs> and so that's when then after the post, obviously a disaster in a meetings as well, then we raised that question. I think in an, any future disasters and stuff, all the industry should sit together. Telecommunication should be given equal uh, preference as well. So, for example, if a helicopter has six seats, doesn't mean all the six seats are taken by the government agency. Maybe a one telecommunication person is in there as well who can do the survey. So, the recovery of the telecommunication networks can start as well. So, those are the few basic things I think all the industry stakeholders need to make sure they work together, collaborate, uh, so they can plan it better. Similarly, I have seen in a Pacific countries when there is any natural disaster, UN. Uh, Pacific food product programs and uh, DFAT Australia and New Zealand are the first ones who normally will send in the flights. 
And as Mr. Vikram also said, the priority on the mobilization as well, how you get in the equipment needs to be probably checked as well and updated in your documentation and your disaster scenarios and planning as well. And we have seen and communicated over the years. Now we have seen actually now the flights coming in can bring in some of the basic satellite communication terminals, some generators as well. Otherwise, if as a telecommunication operator, you have to import those equipment, it can take a week and you don't have a time uh, to wait for a week in these type of natural disasters. So I believe all in all, uh, it, it's very important topic. I think the government, the regulators, the stakeholders, telecommunication operator needs to sit together to have a foolproof uh, planning done. So when you do get these disasters, you can quickly work together to restore instead of trying to work out on all these logistical challenges. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Latif. You also have uh, pointed out uh, the same thing as uh, Mr. Rajinder Singh has done, and we all agree to that fact that, that there should be uh, joint uh, work among the stakeholders, all the stakeholders, to make the proper efforts. So now this is the time to take up the questions from the audience. And there have been multiple questions, but I'll take one or two. So the first question goes that in order to guarantee telecom resiliency, it depends on power security. Does the network have the capability to service all citizens or do you need to prioritize access for persons that is first responders? So this question goes to the panel. Mr. Vikram. Yeah, so uh, one is, you see, uh, uh, like, um, uh, you know, the CTO was just mentioning, the first responders already have adequate resources because they are invariably government, right? Whereas uh, 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 telecom people are invariably private industry. So... Uh, how it is important, I, I, I quite uh, you know like this question is that this is what needs to be done as part of you know the coordination which I had suggested earlier with the local uh, state administration as to what mix of people, uh, men and material and wherewithal will be sent in as the initial response. <laughs> and it will vary. Mr. Vikram, uh, I think the question is that whatever is the network available, whatever telecom services are available, so who should get the priority? So as uh, we are dealing with disaster management, so what we generally do is that we give a priority to the uh, disaster relief agencies that is called first responders in US. This question has come from US. So that priority is given to them and uh, we generally have the first priority to voice and text, small text, not videos. And then the second priority, depending on the situation, we give it to the public for voice and text. And then the third priority goes for video sharing among the DR agencies. So likewise, okay. as per the availability of network. Right, right. So so I think if I'm not wrong, the, the there was a, a recommendations of TREI on priority calling in which, uh, you know, uh, okay. That priority calling, I'm not sure whether it's got implemented or not, but that the whole idea of that recommendation and that consultation was in the given commercial network or whichever the network that's working, uh, uh, how do you allocate priority and how do you shortlist the people who get that priority, right? So uh, that is one part. The second part is, uh, you know, coming back, uh, the 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 uh, the first responders themselves should have their own PPDR network, right? So, in the yeah, absence yeah. of their own uh, network, uh, they, uh, you know, obviously, you'll depend on the commercial network. Yes, I agree that so far as we don't have a PPDR network in a given country, let's say India. So during that time, the priority call routing is very much being implemented in India. And the, so is the case word over. Uh, I would, uh, because of the positive of the time, I would like to move out to the second question, if we can take it. So I think Rajendra ji has got his hand up. Yeah, uh, sir, Rajendra sir, if you want to uh, uh, throw some light on the first question. Yeah, very briefly, I think the point is, uh, what both of you were mentioning is well taken. The 
you know, as we are moving to 5G standalone and with network slicing and this kind of features available, I think the priority can be automatically set in the network that uh, the first responders, they have to get the first priority to respond in and the telecommunication system has to take care of them because that's the that's the most critical area at that time. The second thing, which is about energy consumption, there were a lot of discussion in the chat and Q&A, is that with the disaggregation and softwareization of the network, I think we are moving in a direction where less and less energy requirement will be there at the base station because this will be only the radio unit which will be left at the base station and the rest of this baseband processing like in distribution unit, centralized unit, everything will move away. So our power consumption will come down and that also will help in the disaster situation. Over to you. Thank you for my short intervention. Uh, you, sir. Uh, with that, uh, I think that uh, now we are almost uh, close to the time. So I'm not taking the second question. And uh, with that, uh, I'm uh, handling over to Mr. Anshul Yadav. Before, but before handling over to Anshul Yadav, I would like to thank CDRI and particularly Mr. Anshul Yadav because it is all his efforts. And with that, we have such an esteemed panel with such a variety. And I'm really thankful to Anshul. Over to you, Anshul, please. Thank you, Mr. Sanjay Gural, for moderating this session and kind words for me. And uh, going forward, uh, the deliberation of this panel discussion will definitely help inform CDRI's ongoing initiative, develop innovative and scalable solutions that can enhance uh, infrastructure resilience across the telecom sector, not especially the coastal area one. So some of the key points we have taken for our strategic initiative going forward at CDRI are using uh, innovation and the OFC network, particularly in coastal area, which is like using smart submarine cables, cable systems, flexible uh, flexibility in allocating spectrum during emergency communication uh, you know, situations, shipboard base stations equipped with satellite uh, connectivity, industry government partnership, collaboration with the uh, not only the internal stakeholders with the but with the equipment suppliers, collaboration for men and men uh, material movement during critical situations, disaster simulation exercising, uh, you know, the simulation being done with external stakeholders, including third party suppliers. Insufficient uh, submarine cables in the Pacific region is one of the critical things in coastal area for developing resilience using uh, LEO technology, satellite communication for uh, developing redundancy in dealing with the resilient initiative and these region, regions would be critical. The list is uh, uh, long and uh, due to the paucity of time, I would like to thank all the panel members for their insightful uh, you know, uh, discussion and we have picked up a lot and that will guide CDRI's uh, future strategic telecom resilience initiatives. Uh, we have shared a link on the chat box for all the participants to submit their reviews. Certainly. Request uh, everyone to send their uh, feedback on that uh, link. I would like to thank DOT and all the panel members who have contributed for this dialogue. I would also like to thank all the participants who have joined uh, us for this webinar. And I won't miss this opportunity to thank my colleagues at CDRI, especially communication, IT, and admin team, who has worked tirelessly to make this event a successful one. With this, we come to the end of this session. Thank you once again and have a very good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Namaste. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.